Hi, and welcome to the FIF Pro Podcast, Changing the Game. I'm Allie Riley. During this series, we've been speaking to international female footballers about their personal journeys to success and been discovering what it's taken for them to reach the top of their game. And in celebration of the 30th anniversary of the FIFA Women's World Cup, we've also been looking at how women's football has evolved over the last three decades and been discussing what more needs to be done to protect the well-being of players and ensure that future generations can reach their full potential. Today, in the final episode for this series, I'm joined by Steph Catley. I've been at clubs where the men's team's locker room has the word first team on the front of their door and then the women's will just say academy because it's just shared space with the academy teams. And that doesn't make you feel like we're on an equal playing field. Steph made her international debut for the Australia Women's National Football Team at the age of 18. And seven years later, in 2019, she became their vice captain. Having previously played for clubs in both Australia and the US, Steph currently plays for Arsenal women's team in England. And today the tables are being turned as I'll be moving into the guest hot seat alongside Steph and handing over the usual questioning duties to my good friend and former Football Ferns teammate, Sarah Gregorius, who is the Director of Global Policy and Strategic Relations of Women's Football for FIF Pro. In this episode, we'll be looking ahead to the Women's World Cup of 2023, which is being hosted, of course, by our home countries, Australia and New Zealand. Thanks so much to you both for being on the podcast. Riley, I know that you're contractually obligated to be here, but right. Steph, really appreciate your time. <laughs> but still, very, very nice to have you. And I think my first question with all of that introduction behind us now has to be to you, Riley, how does it feel to be punted from the host duties and have to be subject <laughs> to the grilling of the questions that you've done to so many of your previous guests? Well, I think I would have felt, you know, at ease if it weren't for the fact that it was you doing the questioning since you know me way too well. And we've been on such a long journey together since I think we were, oh my gosh, 17, 18 years old. So I'm excited to hear what you have for us, but I'm excited to share my perspective and my experiences in the game and also hear what Steph has to say. That makes me a little nervous talking about getting grilled. Yeah. <laughs> what is this podcast? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you should absolutely prepare for the worst because I'm ruthless. And as you say, I have all of this power due to the position that I hold and it's completely gone to my head. But don't be too frightened. So between the two of you, you've played for some of the biggest clubs in women's football in the world as well. And I think like what I always find really interesting and, and what I hear about a lot in my job is obviously to do with attitudes around like women's professional teams and women's football and the players in particular maybe Steph you could go first like what is it like at a club like Portland Thorns or, or now you're at Arsenal as well just the general attitude and approach of the club towards the women's team like because I mean they're obviously very successful clubs and and what they achieve but can you tell us a little bit about that attitude and, and how it maybe contributes to that success yeah, for sure. I think Portland was the biggest one for me, you know, coming from Australia. And obviously back then there was still quite a difference in the way that men's teams were treated to women's teams. But, you know, going into Portland, uh, you know, you go in, the locker room is massive. You've got your own gym. You're training on the same field as the men. You get the same amount of fans. You get the same attitude on the street when people are, are walking past you. They know who you are and there's just a level of respect that, you know, coming from Australia, it was just totally different. I think, I mean, in Australia, it's it's different as it is from other countries. I think, you know, it's, it's similar in America where there's so many sports going on that sometimes you just kind of get pushed to the back, I suppose. But in Portland, it didn't feel like that. It just felt like because so much effort was being put into driving the women's team and it was put on the same level as the men's that you know, you got the respect of the fans and the people wanting to come and watch and therefore it sort of evened it out. But it's similar here in, at Arsenal. I think uh, in England, it's just another level. I think football is everybody's world over here. So it's definitely different to home, but there's probably still a little way to go in terms of evening it out because I think, you know, the men's teams are here are just at such a high level and there's obviously um, a very old school culture that goes back years and years of, you know, these guys being 
gods and the absolute pinnacle of everything. So there's definitely still steps to be taken to evening that out. But, um, you know, I'm at an incredible club and we're treated very, very well and compared to what I've come from and where I've seen the game from when I first started playing it, it's night and day. Yeah, that's awesome. And I think, like, that point that you raised about the evening it out and, you know, that's such an entrenched men's football culture in England in particular... Riley, I mean, you've played at Bayern, you've played at Chelsea, and they have huge, obviously, presence in the men's football uh, industry or world or just some of the biggest sporting brands on the planet, full stop. What's it like when you're inside that environment and playing for those really big brands? Like, How do you make your mark as like the women's football side of the organisation? And, and what was it like? And I think particularly because you've had the experience of also playing at Rosengård, which is a standalone women's football club but obviously still very successful like what have you seen what have you noticed in in the attitudes in that regard yeah it's it's interesting to see the different kind of strategies of the different teams in order to try to gain a following and support for for the women's clubs I think with Rosengord to be the top, the, you know, the sun shines on the women's team and to have that feeling, I think is also like, there's something to be said for that, you know, because you're not being ever really compared to a men's team in your club. And the city is so proud of the team. I think the history with all of the championships, the Swedish championships, they've won the history of, you know, making champions league and reaching you know, one of the the knockout rounds, the um, the quarterfinals, almost every year. Obviously, things the the system is changing now, but I just think that experience after being in a very like flashy the WPS that environment felt felt so good. But then moving to a club like Chelsea, where the resources, the facilities, everything was so much better, but it's hard to even enjoy it in a sense some days because you're constantly being compared and then you see how the men have it. So it's like, yeah, it's kind of the same with, um, we talk about like the, the FIFA prize money for the world cup, you know, that it's like, Oh, we're increasing it for the women. Great. But you increased it for the men even more. Like when you just, when the, the difference becomes bigger, it still takes, it takes away from the feeling of, trying to raise the women's game. So that was something that was really weird for me because it wasn't like to have that constant reminder in your face, like being at the same training facility, obviously everything is so good, but it's in your face every day that it's still not as good as the men. Um, And then to go to Bayern Munich where the clubs, the teams are completely separate at different facilities, but it's this like separate, but equal but we know in history, like separate but equal is never really equal. So I think there it was great to be on the on the campus where the women are and where the the men's academies and their their under 19 teams are. But it's still then you don't have that feeling of being part of one club. But I have to say that I've noticed in the past couple of years following, of course, very closely Chelsea and and FC Bayern that they are changing a lot and you see men's players on social media you see the accounts where the on the men's channels they're promoting the women's team and they're saying you know go watch the game the Bayern Munich men's coach was at the Champions League game last night so things like that when you take the salary question out of it because of course that's something we're always going to be talking about pay us more pay us more pay us more but just by like Steph is saying at a Portland Thorns, like the women were probably not being paid the same as the men, but because the club hyped up the teams equally, the fans and the way you felt and the respect and, and kind of the presence you feel really good and it, and it does help. So I think there's so many different, of course, one day we want it to be equal pay, exact same conditions and standards, but you really, a little thing, like social media or the media team approaching both teams the same way. And I see how these English clubs are really starting to do that. You see the followings go up. And for us as women, when social media and engagement and that kind of thing goes up, sponsorship opportunities go up, opportunities to do work, paid work, 
whether it's with a, a Copa 90 or a Fief Pro or, you know, a brand Nike, all of that starts going up. And for us as women, we need those other opportunities. So I think there are things that we can do or we that the clubs and federations and, and businesses, um, but especially clubs can do to without, of course, I want them to start paying us more, but it's something as so simple as having the media team treat the women in the same way. And it can actually do so huge of a difference for us, like for our entire lives. It's so funny because it, there are so many fascinating points that you raise and the whole time like I'm smiling, Steph's like nodding along in complete agreement. But it's true because I think it becomes a very polarizing conversation when it's just about money and people think that it's just about salaries. But it's not. It's it's the whole package. It's the treatment. And I think that's, I mean, we could clip a lot of what you've just said and almost use it as an investment guide to look at the things around, like how do you make everyone feel part of one club because I think particularly in the UK a lot of the narrative now is around like well it's the same badge so you support both teams because it's so if the if the club is truly in your heart it's the same badge and you would go to the men's game and you would go to the women's game usually they fall on different days and that type of thing so it's a really fascinating uh, conversation to have and an interesting reflection that you say on the whole you know, that the, the treatment is about so much more than just obviously equal pay, which is what we'll never stop fighting for and never stop talking about. But yeah, it's really fascinating. I don't know, Steph, you were sort of nodding along if you have any agreements, reflections that are similar. Yeah, I mean, sometimes even for me, it's terminology. Like I've been at clubs where the men's team's locker room has like the words first team on the front of their door and then like the women's will just say academy because it's just shared space with like the academy teams and that doesn't make you feel like we're on an equal playing field even though certain things might be there it's never everything and sometimes it's just that feeling of um you know walking past and seeing first team and knowing well because we're the women's team we're not a first team which is something so small but it can have such an effect on people and on on the women's team in particular. But yeah, I mean, Ali summed it up brilliantly. I was just nodding along like, yes, girl. <laughs> I think there'll be a lot of players listening who are like, yes, Queens, you got it, you're nailing it. So no, I, I couldn't agree more. It's And that's why I asked the question about attitudes because it's, it's so much more than just money. And that's such a simple thing that you raised too, Steph. Like, what does it say from a psychological perspective if first team is only put on the one door and, it, you know, you're always being sort of considered as the other. So that's brilliant. I mean, I could do a huge deep dive into this, but I know I can't, like, take up your entire evenings with, with this discussion. So I'll move on to, I suppose, the not the reason that we're here today, but we have to talk about the Women's World Cup and looking ahead to 2023. And there's so much stuff that I could say about the tournament itself that's already out there in the public going from 24 teams to 32. Uh, you mentioned prize money before, Ali. It's going up or it's doubling at least as far as we know. I mean, there's so many things happening. And I think, though, you've probably been asked this a million times. But before we go any further, could you please each describe the moment that the winning of the World Cup by Australia and New Zealand in 2023, because actually there were nine countries that were interested in hosting it, but obviously Australia and New Zealand came out on top. So maybe, Ali, you can go first. Can you please describe the moment that you found out that you were going to be co-hosting a World Cup? Gladly, Sarah. So I was locked up in my apartment because we had a COVID situation at Orlando Pride. We had just found out that we wouldn't be able to participate in the tournament that was going to be, you know, the first professional sport back since COVID came to the United States and the pandemic. And we we're very excited, obviously, to finally play in this tournament after all these months. And a couple of players got COVID and, you know, we had tried, of course, to follow the protocols, but it is very contagious. So we had found out that we weren't going to this tournament. There were a lot of tears. We were very scared. And again, think back to now, this is almost two years ago when when we didn't know that much about mask wearing and, and symptoms and, and what could happen to you. So I'm in my apartment and I'm talking to Emily Van Egmond, who plays, of course, for the Matildas. And she was very, very stressed out. 
And I'm trying to calm her down about, you know, like you'll, you're going to, you're going to live. We're going to be okay. We'll, we'll live to see another day. And I'm, I'm, I have, I'm, I'm keeping an eye on the time. Like I know it's going to be announced, but like, she's calling me panicking. Of course she is calling me panicked, but she's watching following this. I'm talking to her. So I'm not on my computer. And so she's, I'm like, Emily, it's going to be okay. Like I promise, blah, blah. And she's like, oh, we won the world cup. Hangs up the phone. (laughs) It's the most Emily story I've ever heard. Oh, we won, we won the bid. We won the bid. Hangs up. <laughs> when I'm like, Emily, it's going to be okay. And then I'm like, oh my God. So I run, open the computer. And then I see and and um, Annalie Longo and I think it was Stoddy and, and Wilkie or Aaron. They were all kind of involved. In, and I just started crying. Like the relief and just to have good news in that moment was was so overwhelming. And uh, I called Emily Gilnick. She was sitting on her balcony in Munich drinking a beer and we cheersed. And no, it was it was incredible. And you, Steph. By the way, Ali, we'll talk about your terrible Australian accent later, if that's your yeah, invitation. That, <laughs> that was really not good. That was awful. <laughs> But anyway, let's put that behind us. Steph, go ahead, please. Oh, well, mine was quite different to that. It was... A long, long build-up. We um, had gotten maybe four, four or five girls together in Sydney at the FFA offices, and they'd done. Oh yeah, yeah you were there. they'd done like a whole prep. So the day before, we went in. I think the the morning of the day before, and just we'd done like media and hype and we'd gone to the opera house and they'd flashed like Sam Kerr doing a backflip in Australian colours, like the whole lot, press conferences. It was just like from minute one, it was busy. They had us going back to this hotel room, getting changed into different like Australian kits and suits and for different media ops and then I remember because the announcement wasn't till something like 3 a.m in the morning in Australia or something like that so we went back to our hotel at like maybe midnight and got an hour or so sleep and then back to set up for the whole FIFA whatever it is it was a zoom call and it, we were watching the actual meeting where they vote and everything um so we're in that room for a good hour before it was actually announced and it was just like the most intense situation because you're sitting in a room with all the the big dogs at FFA who obviously put a lot of money into the whole beard and everything and then you've got the guys that work at FFA that have actually set up the beard and put their heart and soul into it and it was just like this bubble of intensity and we're sitting there your COVID spread so we're all on a chair like three meters or whatever it is away from each other just staring at the zoom call at 3am in the morning and then it gets to the Australian New Zealand beard we watch the video you get all excited and then they vote and you literally are sitting there waiting for them to vote and I think it's the closest thing you can get to the feeling you get when your team wins when you're on the football field and you score a goal and it's like that relief and that excitement and you know you're celebrating with your teammates the build up to that and then them finally announcing that it was Australia New Zealand and everyone just erupting and hugging and there was tears. Yeah, the COVID protocols went out the window. <laughs> I saw like the videos of that. Alana, I was la- like, everyone is just hugging. Like, I'm like, well, everyone was all separate. And then, <laughs> yeah, there was no point sitting separate. Everyone was in like the biggest group hug and people were just <laughs> screaming, crying. Like, it was just the best feeling in the world because, I mean, you guys know what a World Cup feels like. And then you imagine that with your friends and your family, you know, sold out crowds. Like you just, it's just, it was just the best feeling thinking about what was to come. And a lot of hard work obviously went into the organisation and the bids and stuff. So the people in that room were just ecstatic. That's wild. And yeah, indescribable almost, I think. Well, I mean, you described it very well with that terrible accent, Ali, but... I I remember as well because, I mean, I had already retired at that point and knew that I wouldn't be participating or playing in it myself, but I I think it was just total disbelief because, I mean, it's such a big event and to think that, yeah, it would be played in your own backyard is just, it's insane. And I can't even imagine, like, how you'll both feel walking out for the first matches. It'll just be, yeah, it it really is sort of once in a lifetime guaranteed, absolutely. 
I think though, and this was announced recently, that the, the tagline of the tournament would be beyond greatness. And, and one thing that I've noticed, uh, particularly in my job, but even as a player as well, uh, there, there's a lot of value statements in football. You know, there's a lot of words thrown around uh, that make you feel good, but it's hard to know necessarily what they mean. So I'm just very curious, what, what, what does beyond greatness mean for the two of you? Or what would you like it to mean for the tournament in 2023? Ellie, you go first. I think for me, I hope that it means that the greatness that that players will achieve, that teams will achieve at this tournament, that the consequences of the tournament will be beyond that. So for me, the greatness is about the talent and what the teams and the soccer part. But what I think so many of us players now, our goals are more than just soccer. And I think hopefully federations and companies and brands that they're on the same page that yes, we want to have this amazing tournament, but we want the effects to be so resounding in other areas. We want it to be about more little girls seeing this tournament and starting to play. We want it to be about higher standards. We want it to be about human rights and just a legacy that's more than just football at the highest level. I mean, that's pretty good. (laughs) That's exactly what it means to Steph as well. (laughs) It's exactly what I was going to say. Well, I mean, that's totally fine as well, because my next question, I know you probably also get asked, like, what do you want to see happen? Like, blah, 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 all of that kind of thing. But what will you be most disappointed by if it doesn't happen in 2023? Like what would really grind your gears if this didn't happen either at the tournament or as a result of it? I don't know. Maybe you can go first on this one, Steph. I mean, it's a tough question because I do think I do have really high hopes for everything that could come out of the tournament. But I think just the I mean for Australia I can't I can't really speak too much for New Zealand but I do think there's still so far to go in terms of the the level of respect that we get as a female national team and I just have so many high hopes for you know the future generations and the girls coming through that want to be Matildas and I just think this World Cup holds so much power in changing the small things and the big things. And I think, you know, if if this World Cup doesn't have a major, major impact on, you know, what we're seeing in women's football there, then I think that would be really disappointing. It's hard to, to pick specifics, but, you know, it's just the small details, the big details that still aren't equal. If this tournament doesn't have an impact on that going forward to the point where where you look at the national team like the US national team and the level of funding and just the overall respect and like we were talking about with the the media opportunities and sponsorships and stuff like that I think if that stuff doesn't come out for for our team and then for you know you guys New Zealand and um yeah almost every other team in the world as well that would be disappointing. Go on, Ellie. You can't just be like, ah, oh, what she said. You have to come up with your own. <laughs> I could say a hundred things that I, I'm i kind of counting on to happen from so many different perspectives. I think for as a football fern, I'll be very disappointed if, if we don't win our first World Cup game and get out of the group stage. Um, but I think I know that we as players for New Zealand – and Australia and all the players around the world will do everything possible for us to play our best soccer. So for me, we, we're going to do, we'll do the job. We will do the things. So for me, I would be so disappointed if after that there isn't, yes, not even just if in New Zealand, it's not even about respect. I think people don't even know about our national team. We're not even at the point where like people can decide if they respect us or not. I honestly think that we don't have enough little girls who know about the football ferns, who know that they can play soccer now for the first time professionally with Wellington Phoenix being in the Australian league. Um, Don't have the opportunities to watch football on, on TV or online. And I think too, once we as players, because we will perform I want to see in every country the minimum 
standard has to be higher, that players will have medical care, that clubs will invest and put a tiny bit percentage of their money into their women's teams, that more games will be on TV, that media outlets will show games, that Sports Center will have highlights from women's soccer games. Because I know that we will do the job. I know that the fans will be excited. So for me, it will be now we will show that we are worth investing in. So if then the companies and the federations and the clubs and the businesses don't invest in us, like there are nothing more that we can do. So that would be for me the biggest disappointment because I know that our countries have worked so hard. Um, I know the players are working so hard despite some of the terrible circumstances that many of us women are in. So it's really for me when we do those things, when we push FIFA now, we have FIFA Pro behind us, but these companies have to reach into their pockets. They have to change their their mottos or how they speak to their employees and who they hire in terms of getting people who support women and support diversity and are basically in this century and this decade and get more women in their businesses. So I just think we're going to show we've seen now like the music and the advertising and, and the billboards, it's all going to be there. So it's like, I, I really do think that we will prove what we're worth. So if people don't jump on board, you know, it's, that will be the biggest disappointment, but I don't think it's going to happen. I really do. And I think we have more women now in positions of power. And I think now too, with social media and the strength we have, if, if businesses, male run businesses or clubs don't, don't support us after this, we've got enough women, like we can't be stopped. But of course, we need our male allies. So I do think that that will be important. And I think the process is already starting to have an effect, even the fact that when we were making the bid, the certain states in Australia, I'm not sure about New Zealand, but in Australia, they had to implement female only change rooms and showers and so many of the clubs in different states didn't have that so they had to build them they had to rework their change rooms and their club rooms to make sure that they could they could cater for women and this wouldn't have happened unless the world cup was even a chance of coming to our country so I mean, it, the change is already there. So as long as something's happening from even the fact that it's on its way, then I think, you know, things are going in the right direction. Oh, you two are the best. There's a lot of very quotable things that you've just said. It's brilliant. I think one thing that just stood out for me is you said the players will do the things, right? That, and that's true, and that's happened at every single World Cup. The performances on the field have been exceptional. The games have been competitive. They've been entertaining. The players will do the things. And so we talked about the role of companies and federations, and you talked about, you know, the, the Wellington Phoenix coming into the A-League for women, and that's obviously a competition that you've played in, Steph, and that has been growing a lot over the years, and through the PFA is, has implemented some really, really good standards, and, and everyone's doing their best in that regard. We haven't talked about FIFA yet, and it's obviously their tournament as well. And they are an organisation that, you know, has a lot of power. They have a lot of control and, and they have quite a substantial amount of money too. Should we have specific expectations from them around what they should obviously deliver at the tournament, but talking about that ongoing legacy and, and the way that they can actually implement certain standards and, and exercise uh, you know, a good deal of control over federations too. Do either of you have expectations of FIFA or, or should we really as a, as a playing group have an expectation of FIFA for how to capitalise on this tournament in, in particular and, and not just, I suppose, banking the benefits but not paying attention to some things that they maybe should be? Yeah, of course. I think obviously the way things have been tracking, I don't know if our expectations can be super high that they'll suddenly give us equal equal prize money, um, things like that. But I do think that we, and a lot of players and and people like you, Sarah, we, ha we feel a responsibility to at least hold them accountable and push for things. And, you know, I don't think we should have to, but I also think if we're not, then, you know, we're not doing ourselves justice. So I think now that 
we have so much information. We know, and there's a men's World Cup coming up. And again, I'm not going to call the men's World Cup just the World Cup and ours, the women's World Cup. There's the men's World Cup and the women's World Cup. We know now we're going to see the men's World Cup. We're going to see, are the players flying business class? Do they have single rooms? How many delegates can fly with them? You know, what are the, the conditions surrounding the games? Again, will they have more fans? Yes, they will. Will it be broadcast more? Yes, it will. Will more people watch it? I don't know. I think we did set some records and we have been setting records in the women's game. But I think that gives us exactly what we need, even beyond the conversation of prize money, to say, look, FIFA is in this position where they can tell people what they should be watching. They can tell people, convince people that women are valuable and worth being invested in because they are the top, the very, very top. So if they even just create the same marketing and and treat the players, just the players the same way beyond the prize money, because we always get so stuck on that. Single rooms, fly us. And now again, we're going to be so far away in the world for a lot of teams that got to be flying comfortably with the jet lag, with everything that comes with having this tournament now where we're located And I think just, it's like, if you're selling anything, if you're going to put, like, even if the products are the same, if you're going to advertise one so much more, people are going to buy that one. So tell people what they should be buying, like package us the same way. And I think they have the resources to do that. And we know they know how, because they'll have just done it with the men's world cup. So I do think too, that because we have these platforms now, And this isn't, you know, a threat, but I just think that we now have these platforms and and these following. So if things aren't the way they should be, and we we talked about some of these things in terms of the rooming situation and some of the hotels, and this is just from a safety point of view, some of the locations of the hotels in previous World Cups, just you didn't feel safe and and the quality of the hotels weren't up to up to standard. So I think now as players, players have millions of followers. So I think too, it's like we now are going to speak out if we aren't being treated how we should be, if we're not being allowed to play our best football, when we're being told you don't put fans in the seats, you don't sell enough jerseys. Well, give us the chance. Like I know we can, but it's like, you're making it even harder for us. So I think, of course we should have some I don't know about expectations, but some demands. And and again, it's not just they're on their own. We have FIFA Pro. We have players who are working closely with FIFA in different areas. Um, We have really qualified, intelligent women who are now given a voice, have been given a voice in FIFA. So I think the time is ripe to work together in the next two years to make sure that things are how we deserve them to be. And if they're not, people are going to hear about it. Go on, Steph. Even though you're nodding, you have to have your own answer. No, I completely agree. I would just say it's it's all it's conditions, isn't it? It's like give us exactly what we need to perform at the absolute best that we can, because that's the product at the end of the day. That's what people come to watch. That's what people are buying tickets to come and see. So if we're getting second rate hotel rooms, like if you like you said, like you think back to to France and. Like some of the beds, some of our taller players, their legs were flopping off the edge. Like there were single beds, we were sharing. And you just know that that's not happening for the men. That is just not the case. So you think about the conditions and they're not the same. So how are you expecting the product to be as up to standard? And I think that's just all that we can ask of FIFA is that those conditions are equal. Like you said, it's not about prize money right now and it's not about money just have us business class flights if that's what the men are getting and you know we'll be watching and we'll be asking the questions when their world cup's happening and taking notes because if that's the same the product's better you're getting more fans everything comes along with that yeah absolutely and i think all of the if those conditions are in place and if it's promoted well and if it's packaged well the players will do the thing. They will really do the thing, and, it, and it'll be an incredible tournament. And actually, one thing that you mentioned uh, and was part of my research when I was getting ready for, for interviewing you two superstars is you, you've talked a lot in previous episodes, Ali, about social media and about following and the fact that it's provided, I suppose, on the one hand, 
you can show the evidence that women's football is growing and it's where it is and it's worth watching because you get that instant feedback. And it also now is a tool of accountability, really, as you say, because we can be very open and very transparent because everybody has a camera with them and they can film something that's not going the way that it should be. And and, and players will have the ability to do that at the tournament in 2023. One very interesting statistic for our uh, listeners that I think is really important and, and why I wanted to have this conversation about social media. Steph, you have 85,000 followers on Instagram. Ali, you have 56 and a half thousand followers on Instagram. If anyone else is interested, I have 1,497 followers on Instagram. Oh, we celebrated that <laughs> 1K, baby. I remember. I know. Actually, you were the one that forced me to put my Instagram profile on public, which <laughs> I had like rebelled against for several years. It hasn't helped yeah, you, clearly. I mean, I'm a prolific poster on social media. Uh, so obviously between the three of us, maybe not so much me, we have a degree of a following um, publicly, but... When you've had the conversation with previous guests, Ellie, you've talked about how, you know, we can use it to hold people to account, obviously, but also promote the game ourselves. I'm just interested in whether you actually like that or if it's more of a necessary evil. With you both having such big followings comes a bit of an expectation, right? People want to see into your lives. They want to see what you're up to. But how do you feel about kind of having that dual responsibility of... I guess also doing a lot of promotion of the sport uh, because it's actually not being done, as you say, by the companies, by the media organisations, sometimes by the clubs themselves. Is it fun or is it kind of like a necessary evil in a way? Maybe because you've talked about it so much on the previous episodes. Ali, you can go first on this one again. For me, I I do feel it is a responsibility that, you know, can be taxing at times. I'm doing it so that the next players can use their social media to do exactly what they want and and they don't feel that pressure. Um, and I'm lucky enough to now work with FIFA Pro Just Women's Sports. And for me, you know, we're all empowering each other. So I will use my platform to help hopefully, you know, increase awareness of an organization like FIFA Pro to get subscribers and viewers to a platform like just women sports and they're doing the same for me. So, um, absolutely. You know, I, I really, really, really think it's a shame that it's on us, but I am happy to do it. And again, I'm, I'm super open and, and I love making videos and reels and whatever, you know, it, it's, it is something I enjoy, but I definitely see it as part of a, important part of my job because I I want the landscape for women's sport to get better. And you, Steph, with your 85,000 followers on Instagram, which is, I mean, you know, the thing that's really interesting about both your profiles is they just put a K. (laughs) Like mine counts, it's so low that they count the exact number of mine, but the two of you get a K next to There's too many zeros afterwards. But Steph, how do you feel about the role of social media in your career and, and for the sport more broadly? Yeah, I mean, it's not something that I necessarily enjoy and it's not something that I think we should have to do, obviously, at this point, but it is something that we do have to do um, and that I think now is more it's more natural for me just because I've always had to promote and, you know, you're when you're playing a game, you'll repost the tile that your club puts on just to make everyone aware that, hey, we're actually playing today. That's really cool. Yeah, yeah. And that's just something that I think comes naturally. It's something I do automatically. And I definitely hope that that's not the case in the future. And I think us doing the promotion now and pushing and doing what we have to do with our social media platforms, if that means that in the future it'll be a lot better, then it's definitely worth it. And to be honest, like... Right now in the state of women's sport, I I love celebrating other women doing amazing things. So if that's retweeting them and um, getting involved with my social media in, you know, women's tennis or basketball or whatever it is and just retweeting, reposting and getting involved in those conversations, if that's helping their sport and those women, then I, I actually love doing that. So it's something that um, we shouldn't 
necessarily have to do. It's just the state of where we're at at the moment. But in terms of, you know, celebrating other women and stuff like that on social media, I, I do actually really enjoy doing that and being part of those conversations. It's just so amazing to me when I think about after listening to Steph and, and having spoken with some incredible women, current and former players, like we are playing football. We are, you know, maybe in school, maybe have another job, um, maybe doing charity work, probably have some kind of project, whether it's current or we're building something for the future. We're planning what will we do when we retire because we will have to earn money. We're on social media promoting ourselves, promoting our club, um, promoting other women. And we're ballers. Imagine how we would be if we didn't have to do all those things and only play soccer. Like that's the dream. You know, that's what these guys are all doing. And I just look how amazing the sport is and where we've come to. And everyone is still basically having a side hustle, even if you don't have to have a side hustle like everyone is. Like we talk about someone who's probably at the highest, highest percentage or the smallest percentage, someone like Alex Morgan. She's still spending her time starting a company and she has a baby and she's, you know, like it's because we feel this responsibility and and we want to empower other women too. But I'm just like, uh, like we talk about the, when we get this criticism about, you know, what the game looks like or, you know, what the standard is like. And it's like, okay, first of all, it's, they're wrong. The standard is great, but also like, Think about what all of us are spending our energy on all day and thinking about. Like, it's not just, we can't just do our job. And honestly, in my job, I see all of that, you know, because we're a a trade union, so we represent workers, but in women's professional football, even the term professionalism, all that actually means is you have to earn more than you spend. And under FIFA's regulations, that means that you're a professional player. That could be $5, and you would be termed a professional. But that's obviously, it's not a living wage by any stretch of the imagination. So that, we see everything. We know that there are are mothers, you know, even like people going to school, holding down different jobs, even the ones that obviously earn enough from playing the sport, they still, they're doing master's degrees or or PhDs or they're starting companies or they're... Nadia Nadim is about to be a doctor in January. I'm like... (laughs) It's incredible. And you're right. It's like, imagine that is so much energy and it's so much positive energy. But imagine if that was being channeled just into the sport. I mean, not saying that everyone would do that necessarily, but... Right, but it would be an option. You have the option. your choice. Yes, exactly. You have the option to do so, to just pour everything into the sport that you love because we all love it and that's why we played it for so many years when it wasn't a viable career option, right? So I I see all of that as well and I think that's why it's it's just so important to keep re-emphasizing that point And, and it really is part of what makes our game special at the same time is you just have incredible people not just incredible athletes but really incredible people doing unbelievable work and you know I mean we're all relatively young Steph obviously is a lot younger than you and I Ellie but you know doing a lot with the time that we have and and I think it should be celebrated as well and but as you say I mean on the men's side, they have their own social media managers, some of them, that they're not even having to log on themselves and build that profile. Someone does it for them. So it's just incredible. And again, we could spend a lot of time going into, I guess, these details, but I know that we probably have to wrap up soon uh, or I'm going to get in a lot of trouble. But I think the last question for both of you is, and maybe sort of a little bit in the spirit of, of what we've just discussed, what, what's the one thing that you wish people would just get about women's football and about you as players that you think they just don't understand from the outside looking in. Like if you could just sort of leave, I mean, this is the the last episode of the series. If you could just leave them with one thing that you like, oh, I really wish that they walk away and they just understand this one thing about us as players, or even if it's about the sport in general, what would it be? I mean, I would just say that the main thing for me, you know, coming through as a female footballer and obviously everyone always compares men's football to women's football. The one thing for me would just be that the acceptance that it's different, but there's so many amazing things about women's football that makes it an incredible product. And 
it's different in so many good ways. And I think if people just stopped making those direct comparisons to they're faster and stronger, so they're always going to be better. I think it's just it, the word better just it doesn't apply in the circumstance because they're completely different. And I think that's the frustrating thing when you're trying to get that point across that we're never going to be the same as men. And it's physically impossible it's different but what we do and how we play and the style that we play and the the level of skill and everything is incredible and I just think people don't give it the opportunity and have an open mind in that sense there's so many people out there that are just ready to you know push it away because it's it's not the same as the men and they, they're making that direct comparison so that for me is something that always eats me up and always annoys me when you're reading comments and things on on social media that's a good one Riley I think that probably is the biggest and most like relatable kind of argument that would be the best thing for people to understand in terms of just everything you just said um with it just being a different game and like accept it and love it. If I have to say something different, I wish that people would get that we put in the same amount of hours and training as the men. So again, you know, it it is a different sport, but I mean, if you think about that in other jobs, like if you have, um, you know, a pilot or a doctor or a teacher. And I know that women are underpaid compared to men. But in terms of the difference in salaries and conditions in sport and in soccer, I I don't think that people would accept that in any other job. Like literally, it is such a drastic difference. And I also think that sport has given me as a woman so much in terms of my confidence and being healthy, body image, leadership, resilience, teamwork. And I think that it is such a shame if people don't, again, usually men, don't understand that encouraging girls to play sport and and helping facilitate girls around the world to play sport we're missing out on something so important in terms of our society and to build these leaders and amazing, strong people. And two, I think we are proving in terms of the numbers. If you look at the WNBA, if you look at what's going on in, in England, we are marketable and we are worth investing in. Companies can make money by investing in women's sports. So for me, it's like twofold in terms of supporting women's sports. It's for these young girls who it will improve their lives, which then in turn, I think will improve society so much. And then also like you can make money off of us. So just invest in us, you know, and a key part of that is understanding that it's not the same sport as the men, but it is still the beautiful game. It is still exciting and it is still valuable. Yeah, I agree. And it it baffles me as well, because surely the, the joy and the richness is, is watching the competition, right? Just p- seeing people at the top of their game, at the top of their sport, like the passion, the competition, the relentless desire to win. That That's, I mean, it's better than reality TV, watching sport, you know? It, and women's football has all of that. And, and I couldn't agree with what you both said more. And I think it's probably a good point to maybe wrap up today's episode of changing the game because I really think if we can change that type of mentality we will change the game and all of a sudden that return on investment which is it's coming it's on its way anyway but it'll it'll just come in waves it'll be an absolute avalanche so thank you so much for being on the podcast and Ali for hosting this series as well and yeah really appreciate it and hopefully when people stop listening to this podcast they take away some of those really important key messages and realize that you two are badass women but the sport is full of them as well so really appreciate it and we'll call it a day there that's all for this episode and for the first series of changing the game my thanks to all our incredible guests who have taken the time to chat about their world cup experiences i hope you've enjoyed listening see you again soon